Good morning. Welcome to our worship service here at New Prospect United Methodist Church in Beaufort. I am Pastor Mickey. Um, I just want to say thank you. We thank you. You know, our church really um, appreciates very much being able to connect um, in this way, especially in this time. Any opportunities that we have to gather as a body, um, especially in these days of Advent, especially in this season. Uh, you know, this year um, has been a, a difficult year, you know, in many, many ways. And so especially in these weeks, Things are different, things feel different, things in this season do not feel as, as they have in prior years. And so the opportunities to connect and to gather, remembering and reflecting together as the body of Christ, he who is the greatest gift, the coming of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. I mean, it's quite a privilege and a blessing in this season. So thank you so much for connecting and joining with us um, this week. I want to offer a few announcements. We are doing things a little differently at the church um, this Advent season. Of course, we have kind of gone back and forth with making plans for Advent and just sorting out ways to gather, um, but really want to do so in a way that keeps folks safe, you know, recognizing we are seeing the light of, at the end of this tunnel. As our bishop said this past week, we, we see and, and um, believe that um, immunizations are coming, have been developed. We know it will still be some time, but, but we have hope um, that these things are coming and that we are seeing the end of this season approaching. So, but we want to finish well. You know, we want to um, celebrate this time, reflect together as a body on the gift of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, but we want to do so in a way that um, not only keeps us safe, um, but also allows anyone who wants to come and worship, we want to provide opportunities that anyone can enjoy together. Um, we want to be um, able to include even those folks who are high risk. We want to do things that allow all of us to gather. And we also want to support our medical community. You know, we understand that um, local hospitals in our area, they are making plans uh, for a spike around Christmas time, assuming that folks will be traveling, assuming that churches will be gathering for Christmas Eve, for example, um, and even making plans for, you know, ICU beds to run out um, a, a lot of our hospitals locally. And so 
as the church, we want to be careful to support this medical community, those who are working on the front lines in this um, virus, that we support them with our prayers, we support them with our hearts, our thoughts, but that we also support them with our actions. And so we want to make plans of gathering at the church, keeping in mind we don't want to make their job more difficult than it already is in this season. We, we, we want to support those folks, remembering they are, they are parts of families. They are mothers and fathers and children and, and brothers and sisters. And so we want to support the medical community in that way in this season as well. So keeping all that in mind, these are the events that we have been planning or putting together for the coming weeks. First of all, on next Sunday, December the 13th, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. that evening, we will be having our drop-in communion and walk of lights. That will be primarily an outdoor event. You will be able to come anytime between 5.30 and 7 with your family that evening. We will also have the sanctuary open for one family at a time to be able to come in and to receive communion here at the altar. Um, I will be in here I'll have my mask, we'll be wearing masks inside, um, and we will be cleaning, disinfecting the altar rail between each family. We will have the doors open, so it will be chilly in here. So wear your coats, it's an outdoor event. But we want to offer that opportunity for families to drop in to come in to receive communion. And then outside on our front lawn, we will have our walk of lights. It will include some coffee and cocoa. We will have a live nativity out in front of our church. And we will have a place of prayer, an opportunity for folks to, to think about, um, reflect prayerfully, um, you know, what are some of the concerns, places of need um, this season. And so we just want to welcome you um, just to come next sunday december 13th 5 30 to 7 p.m you're welcome to come with your families um, for those events also monday december the 14th the next monday a week from tomorrow from 10 a.m to 1 p.m is our monthly food pantry we do that with hope for the hungry each month we want to welcome families who want to come and serve we do that in the flc um, our, our service team is, is smaller so we're able to space out over there give everyone plenty of room if you'd like to come be a part of that, come on. We would love to have you. And if you know a family or if your family could use a box of food, um, this is a trying season for a lot of families. So please feel free to come and join us for our food pantry next Monday, December the 14th. Also, Saturday, December the 19th, we are going to be putting together our food boxes to support local families from a local school here in Buford. We know that um, there are families that, you know, when we have these Christmas breaks, when we kids have a couple of weeks off, we love our breaks, of course, and we're looking forward to that. But we also know that a lot of kids, um, they struggle in that time because they're not getting their breakfast and their lunch from school that they typically would get every day. And so we're just going to put together some boxes. We're supporting 20 families from a local school. They're going to come Saturday morning, the 19th, they're going to come pick up those boxes. If you would like to come be a part of putting those boxes together, distributing those boxes to family, just um, welcoming families, blessing them, um, December the 19th, 9 o'clock to noon that morning, please come on. We'd love to have you here again in the FLC behind me, and we will be um, spacing out, wearing our mask, being very careful then. And then finally, December the 24th, Christmas Eve. Um, we have gone back and forth. I want to apologize. I've struggled with this decision, um, but we have finally decided again with rising rates of the virus, trying to support our local community. We're going to hold a smaller service. We're going to hold it outside. We're going to set up um, a speaker right out there in front of our church in the grass. We're going to pray for some, some dry weather, you know, for that, that time at 5 p.m. December the 24th. We're going to gather right out in front of our church for a time of reading the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke. We're going to have a time of singing a couple of songs together. We're going to have coffee, hot cocoa available, and we're going to pray together. You know, we're just going to gather. It will be a short service. It won't, it won't be super formal. It won't be long. But I will encourage families to come together, bring your blankets, bundle up, you know, treat it as though you're going to a Christmas parade, you know, getting outdoors. We'll probably be out there about 30 minutes or so. Um, but it'll just be a time to quietly reflect in the midst of all the noise, to remember in those hours of Christmas Eve, those precious hours, to reflect and remember um, the great gift of our King and Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to welcome you to come on out December the 24th, right out here at five o'clock in front of our church. So now as we um, continue with our service, let's go into a time of prayer this morning. 
Holy Father, um, I thank you so much, Lord God, for the gift of life this morning, the gift of your Son, the gift of gathering these things, Father, with every passing day, they are becoming more and more precious, Father, and I ask, Lord, that you will forgive me, that I have for so many days of my life taken for granted the gift of gathering, the gift of gathering with brothers and sisters, the gift of good health, the gift of good health in my family. Gracious Father, we praise you and thank you for the gift of life and gathering this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we praise you this morning for the coming of our Lord. You yourself came, Lord God, Emmanuel, God with us, and that this season is um, so precious that we set aside these weeks and these days especially to reflect upon this great gift. Lord God, I pray that you will bless this time that we are still in this season of, of worshiping in different places and in different ways. Merciful God, we praise you that even in these ways, Father, your Holy Spirit is with us. God with us. This is the great message, the promise and the hope of the prophets before you know, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is the promise that we have now after. As the church, the Lord our God goes with us, whether we are navigating storms or walking on the mountaintops or in the valley below, gracious God, you go with us. The Lord our God, you are great shepherd. And so we just praise you and thank you this morning, and I pray that in this service, we will have a renewed experience and assurance of your presence with us, wherever we are. Father, Lord, I pray that you will bring healing. There are a number of members of our congregation who, who know family, have close loved ones who are struggling with this virus. I'm struggling to have healing. We know a lot of folks who are struggling um, with other um, medical issues, have surgeries coming up, test results that they are awaiting. Merciful Father, that you will move, I pray. Send your Holy Spirit into these lives, into our bodies to bring healing and protection by the blood of your Son, the Lord Christ Jesus. Lord God, I pray that you will um, continue to lead us as we serve. Father, you have provided so abundantly in this community through these days and weeks blessing and praise to you father god for you are our provider and you yourself are the provision christ jesus said i am the bread of life and you are our provision lord god father i pray you will continue to be that provision that we will see your hands providing and that we will wait upon your guidance in the ways to use the the provision that you bring that through this community and through this congregation, Father God, families will see provision and they will see that you, Father God, have done these things. Your name be glorified, Father, I pray. Lord, I pray um, that you will continue to bless this time, Father. Thank you so much for hearing our prayers, blessing and praise to you, Father, and all that we do and say. And to your holy name, the name of your Son, the Lord and King Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our message this morning it comes from the prophet Isaiah. Um, today is the second Sunday of Advent, the Sunday that we reflect on the gift of faith, you know, and we look to the prophets of the Old Testament and their writings about the coming Messiah, the coming Savior. We look to their example of faith, um, especially in this season. Today is also Communion Sunday, and so if you want to, as we are getting ready to, to look at this passage for a few moments to reflect upon God's Word and this season of Advent. If you want to go ahead and, and gather some bread or some juice or some elements from your kitchen to prepare for us to receive communion in just a few moments, I would encourage you to go ahead and do that now. Um, so as you're doing that, let's go ahead. Let's read our passage today from Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Well, it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And what an incredible passage that we have here from the prophet Isaiah. This prophecy, the coming of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, I think it's helpful, you know, as I often say when we look at some of these passages, it's good and helpful for us to consider for a moment the original audience here, to remember the audience to whom the prophet was writing these words. Um, so it's generally agreed, you know, that these prophecies, we know they were written for the Israelite people, 
But it's a great that this portion of Isaiah, starting here at chapter 40, this was actually written during the time of the Israelite exile. Right, as we read about this, you know, in 2 Kings, we read about this. It's also written about in 2 Chronicles. Um, and in this book, the book of Isaiah, the chapters leading up to this point, this point of chapter 40, the chapters before this, they are filled with a lot of warning. A lot of warning of a coming judgment against the Israelite people. Now, why? Because we know the Israelites, they struggled with idolatry. Right? They, they followed um, the idols of this world. They were not waiting on God. They were not trusting in the Lord their God. They were not waiting upon him, listening for his voice, but they were, they were following the trends and the voices and the noises and the idols that the world was presenting them, right? And so we know that God gave them many warnings. You know, he sent many prophets. He said, return to me, repent of these ways, turn away from these worldly idols and distractions and noises, return to me. All right, and it's in the chapter just before ours today, Isaiah chapter 39, we have what seems to be almost this kind of random story here. Um, and it's about a story about visitors who came to visit Jerusalem, to come visit King Hezekiah. He was the king at that time. And these were visitors who had been sent from Babylon. Visitors who had been sent by the king of Babylon. And so, you know, we know that um, Hezekiah, he was, he was generally a good king in Israel. He, he did many things um, to kind of follow in the ways of the Lord. And, and he did many things that were considered to be good, right, in the sight of God. So the Lord had blessed Hezekiah. Like a lot of people had brought gifts to him. He had accumulated a great deal of wealth and esteem. Um, but unfortunately, this wealth began to kind of change Hezekiah's heart, and he became a little arrogant, a little prideful, right, about the wealth that he had accumulated. All right, and so these visitors come from Babylon, and he wants to show them everything. He wants to show them his wealth. So he shows them, you know, his palace. He shows them, you know, his, uh, his storehouses. He had storehouses full of silver and gold and olive oil. He showed them all of his wealth. Right, And then the prophet Isaiah went to go see Hezekiah. He knew he'd had some visitors, and he goes and he says, who, who were those visitors you know, who came to see you? Hezekiah says, oh, they came from Babylon. The king of Babylon sent them to come and, and meet with me and to visit me. Isaiah asked the king, Hezekiah, he said, what did you show them? Did they see all of your palace? Hezekiah said, oh, yes, I showed them all of my palace. I showed them my armory. I showed them my storehouses. He says, there was nothing of my wealth that I did not show them. All right? And this is what Isaiah then said to King Hezekiah there um, in Isaiah 39. He said, hear the word of the Lord Almighty. He said, the time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, they will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And the word of the Lord, this is what Hezekiah said to Isaiah, he said, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, he said, for he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. All right, so it's very interesting. Hezekiah, he hears this prophecy from Isaiah, this warning of judgment that was coming, but his descendants, his children, and children, like his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, that they would be carried away from Jerusalem, away from their home. They will be taken as exiles against their will into Babylon. And it's so interesting, Hezekiah doesn't seem to feel much concern. We see here that not only has the wealth made him a little bit prideful, but it's made him lose his ability to feel compassion, even for his own descendants, even for his own children's children and grandchildren. Because he has this relief, well, this is not going to happen to me. Right? His only concern here is for his own life. He cannot see and have compassion for the generations coming after him. And so that's really interesting to see what this wealth has done for him 
And so, so we see this prophecy from Isaiah, this prophecy of the coming exile, and this is what happened. This was fulfilled. We, we can read about this again in, in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. They both tell this story of the exile of Israel into Babylon. But then we move into our passage from today, chapter 40 of Isaiah. We, we recognize that this was written after the exile has happened. And we find the prophet here no longer giving these stark warnings and judgments from the Lord God, but we see that he is um, taking on a dramatically different tone here. As he's writing to the Israelites, those have been, who have been taken away, whose families have been taken away, the majority of the Israelites were taken away into Babylon. Look at the change in his tone here in chapter 40. He goes from these harsh warnings, and he says in those opening words, Comfort, comfort for my people. God says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now we know that the prophet here, he's writing these words of comfort to the Israelites. And they are in their exile in Babylon. But it's, it's interesting as we read this passage as the church today, we are reading it many, many years later after the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, after his birth and after his crucifixion, his resurrection. And we can see that these words are, are there about more than just comfort for the Israelites who were in exile, right? But these words are words that speak quite a bit about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, about the price that was paid Double, the prophet says, for our sins. And through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we read these words and we understand that the price for our sins, it wasn't just paid, you know, barely, but it was paid in double. It was paid abundantly through the life, the crucifixion, resurrection of our Lord and King Jesus Christ. We see these words today. They are life to us because we can see there's so much more that God is saying through the prophet Isaiah than probably even the original audience understood. We read in verse 3, a voice of one calling, In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Like we understand that now to be a reference even to John the Baptist. We looked at him some last week. All right, in verse 9, it says, You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. The Lord God is coming himself says, see, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, his recompense or his earnings. They accompany him. Right? He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. I want to encourage us to reflect on these words in these days. It is significant for me to remember that they were originally written to a people who had been taken, exiled from their home, right? A people who had been taken from all that they had ever known, had been forcefully removed from their way of life, especially as I reflect on these words in this season, in this year, all right? And I think of all that we ourselves our generation, the generation of the church, our community, and even in the world, all that we have faced in this year, you know, um, being removed from the things that we have always known, having so much of our lifestyle broken and removed from us in these days. You know, our usual um, sources of comfort, even our gatherings and our relationships, they have been shaken in this season, and our eyes have been opened to see new realities all around us that we either couldn't see before, and in some cases, um, our eyes have been opened to see realities around us that we just didn't want to see before. It has been a season of a lot of shaking in our worlds as we have always known them, and I think many of us can relate to this feeling of exile 
in this season of Advent this year. This feeling of being unsettled, you know, missing um, that feeling of home, right? I believe we can relate to that feeling that, that comes when we, you know, we, we are walking this long, dark journey, walking, you know, through the valley, consistently unsure uh, about what lies ahead, desperately wanting to see that light come, to see our path straighten, to be able to see something familiar, right? And it just won't come. Constantly having to reset our plans, constantly having to readjust our views of our surroundings, um, our views of the world, our communities. is constantly, everything is constantly being shaken again and again in this journey, this season of walking. And it feels a little bit like exile. We just can't find our home. We just can't find our footing. Now think about the Christmas story. We remember, you know, the night that Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph were not in their home, right? They had had to travel. Remember, they had left. They had gone to the city of David. Joseph was from the line of David. They had to go for the census. They had to go to their, the, the, the hometown from their family. And David was, um, excuse me, Joseph was of the family of David. So they went to Bethlehem. We remember David um, was born in Bethlehem. We had that story over in Ruth. We hear about that. And so remember what they, they got there, Mary and Joseph, they had this long journey. They got to Bethlehem, and then they couldn't even find a bed to sleep in. They couldn't find a room to sleep in. And so they had to take shelter in, in the stable, in a place for animals. You know, and I, and I think it is likely, you know, Joseph, um, he probably knew some folks there. He, he had some family there. But I think about Mary, you know, Mary giving birth to her first child that night in a stable, away from her home, away from her closest relatives and loved ones, in this place, Bethlehem, that was not her hometown. I think about that. Remember, she had been told by the angel Gabriel, she had been visited by Gabriel, had told her, oh, this child that you will you will bear, this child will be given the throne of David. All right, this child will, he will have a kingdom that will never end. Remember the things she had heard about this promised child that was to come. And now here is the night this child is born and she is away from her loved one. She's away from her home. She's in this stable, right? And we know that even when Jesus was a young boy, we remember the Magi, they came to see him. And because of their visit, King Herod heard about this child and then went out and tried to kill him. And Jesus and his family had to flee again, leave their home, become refugees in Egypt. All right, And we remember Christ himself. You know, when we go back and we read in, in the second chapter of Philippians, he who left the glory of heaven, his kingdom, and he made himself nothing. You know, Isaiah tells us that he had no beauty. He had no majesty in this world, right? Nothing that would make him attractive or popular to this world. But he came as one who was despised, one who was rejected by mankind, right? He was a man of suffering. Right. In this world, people turned their faces away from him. They pretended as though they could not even see him. Right, Sort of like um, I think sometimes we do. A lot of times in this world, when we see a person, for example, for example who is experiencing homelessness, right, or, or we see suffering of a child who maybe is a refugee child, you know, or a child who's lost their family or who does not have a home or who is hungry. Sometimes we don't want to have to look upon such suffering, and so we just turn our eyes away. We pretend we didn't see it, right? And this is what happened to Christ. Isaiah tells us, the prophet tells us, this was his experience in this world. He had removed himself from his kingdom and the glory of God in that kingdom, and he made himself nothing in this world. He never made himself comfortable here. He was the rejected in this world. He was consistently the picture of suffering and injustice, right, that made proper people want to turn their heads and look away. 
right? He never made his home in this world. And so, you know, as followers of Jesus Christ this morning, as we reflect upon the coming of our Lord in this season of Advent, my question for us today as we wait upon his coming again is how comfortable have we made ourselves in this world? All right, where are we making our home today? You know, I think, you know, in this season, you know, even, even as we are struggling through um, the difficulties and, and the suffering of this virus and all of um, the, the struggles that that has created in our communities, you know, um, and as we are exposed more and more to the injustices that are even happening in our own communities that maybe we had not seen or had not wanted to see, before. It seems that God may be using these things in this season to remind us that we are not to become too comfortable in this world, right? We are, are not called to build up our worldly homes and to build up places of comfort um, amongst the things of this world, right? But we are to find our home in the places where Christ himself found his place and home in this world the places of injustice. We are to find our home in the places of suffering. We are to find our home amongst those in this world who are the rejected. This is where the followers of Christ should be. We are not to find our comfort in the idols that this world offers, and there are many. We are not to find our comfort in the distractions and in the noises, and especially in this season of Advent, there are so many distractions and noises, but we are called to find our comfort in the presence of our Lord, our shepherd. As we imagine our shepherd guiding us, navigating us through this, this valley, this valley of darkness, even in this season, and we cannot see even where to place our next step. We do not find our comfort in this world, but we find our comfort in our shepherd who guides us. Even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. Let it be so for us in these days. I pray God's blessing upon you in this season of Advent. And so now as we um, go into our time of communion, if you have not already, I encourage you to go now and get for yourself some bread, some juice, some wine, however you would like to receive communion this morning. And as you do that, I want to share with you our invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. And so the confession and pardon will be on your screen if you would like to say that with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, I thank you for this opportunity to remember your Son, our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, to remember his offering, the offering of his body and his blood on the cross, which he offered for our sins, and to remember the good news that it was more than enough that we are offered salvation, that the debt of our sin was paid for in full and even abundantly, as our passage this morning from Isaiah reminds us, blessing and praise to you, Christ our King, our Lord, and our Savior. I pray you will make these elements for us by your Holy Spirit. Let them be for us the body and the blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that this morning we can partake and remember we are called to receive him anew every single day by your grace, by the presence of your Holy Spirit, which goes with us faithfully, Lord God. 
in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And so now you may take the bread. Do we remember that on the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, Holy Father. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So you may now eat the bread. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now you may drink the juice. Right, let's close in prayer of thanksgiving. Heavenly Father, bless you, praise you, Lord, and thank you so for this meal, for your provision, holy God, in each of our lives. Praise you, Lord God, for the gift of your Son, the resurrected King and Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, I pray now that you will go forth with us into this day, into this week. Lord God, that we will remember with each new morning our, our sins are forgiven. By the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, we are redeemed. Thank you, Father God. I pray that you will be blessed, that your name will be exalted and lifted up in all that we do and say in this day and in all things. In the name of your Son, our Lord and King Jesus Christ, we pray. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Blessing, peace be with you through this day and through this week. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.